Hello, honey. Hey, Andreas. How are you? I'm good. Uh, how are you? Very well, very well. Uh, Super. Yeah. Hey, I'm um, preparing for this talk. I just I read on your Instagram that you're happy to go back to your office after a long period of, of not being in your office because of COVID-19. How long was that period? So we, uh, we had a very strange thing happen, very biblical events. We first had a flood in our archive rooms. We lost a considerable amount of work, uh, especially the computer work, which was kind of strangely weird. Uh, strange um, and then uh, that happened exactly, I think, six weeks prior to the pandemic. <laughs> so we had the flood, then we had the pandemic. We waited for the locusts. They didn't come yet. Um, but basically, that, that that's been five months, actually. It was five months since we had to close our office. Uh, we just finished, um, uh, you know, we, New York is now in phase three, and we just managed to come back in here. It's actually kind of great being I'll walk around a little bit. Um, yeah. But cool. um, yeah, this is actually my own office here, and my, my uh, idea wall, which is, which strangely enough was frozen five months ago. So it was like walking into some kind of strange <laughs> time capsule. I have my, my Thomas Roof uh, images here that, that stare at me all day long. Um, and then out here we, we have um, the gallery where we, uh, again, sort of frozen in time five months ago, models and, and things that were, um, yeah, yeah. that were sort of in progress uh, around here. And uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's nice, it's nice to be back. It's kind of been exciting to be, uh, be back to work. Uh, cool. Here. So, you know, it's interesting when we met, that was in the late 90s uh, at Columbia. Mm -hmm. I remember you teaching, but also in your practice, were really <laughs> trying to get a grip on what could be, um, you know, a, a, a spatial presence of architecture that is not ref that is not uh, reduced to the classical three dimensions to the classical materiality of architecture but actually that addresses the um, virtualization of our culture which was up and running at that time the internet let's say the world wide web had been introduced about five years before in 1993 or four so this was really the thing can architecture kind of extend its fingers and arms into the digital and you were making all kinds of um, installations uh, during this this to, to test this kind of hypothesis now in a, in a strange way of course in the medium in the period between them you have become quite physical i would say you have um, engaged in building uh, I was like, uh, uh, you, right let's get <laughs> yeah and the the interesting thing is this covid 19 condition of course forced you back into this virtual condition that at the beginning of your, your career was so keen on, 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 on kind of testing. Yeah. So yeah. what I was wondering is, was this period of not being able to work together with other people in a physical space a joyful experience or was it kind of maddening? So how did you, how did you re live this period? You know, it's funny. Many years ago, when I first met you actually, we, uh, we were uh, I was a paperless at Columbia University I had a, I, and I had decided under Bernard kind of um, let's this Greg Lynn and I both took on paperless what we call paperless studios we found ourselves working uh, in the world without tools and in digital realms for the first and I think for most people listening to this it must sound weird but there was a moment when we had didn't have these machines to work with <laughs> um, we we kind of I kind of sort of fanatic studio at that time with my um, and I, I had them all 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 analog tools and work completely in the digital. Uh, and after the, the full semester, actually it was even the year, I remember walking up to one of my, um, Michael, and I, and, I, and I looked at him and he was at his desk and he looked up to me with bright red eyes. And, and I said to him, are you okay? I mean, it's, it's, you know, you've been stuck inside this digital world. At that time, again, super novel, super new. And he said, and pardon my French here, he said, uh, you know, Hanny, after five months in, uh, in virtual, reality, virtual space, reality is so fucking interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I will I'll never forget that. And I think well, these last five years have made it really apparent what we, are, what we lose by uh, being um, isolated and being in virtual realms and working digitally and so on. And also how fascinating it is to work together uh, and to be with people. Uh, it's kind of a re, <laughs> it sounds strange, but it's like we're reappreciating the reality of 
social socializing. I mean, you know, it's it's just it's nice to have to talk to real friends, not Facebook friends. It's nice to it's interesting to get in a room with my with my staff here, with my designers, um, and and discuss a, a real model, even if we're wearing masks. Uh, it, it's just interesting to, to find and and. So there's a regained appreciation for the things that we um, sort of left behind that we took for granted, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, in a weird way, that, that's one side of it. The other side of it is that since we were doing VR stuff and AR stuff way back in the 90s, believe it or not, um, and then kind of stopped for a while. Um, I, the Stock I think, Exchange project, right? For instance, the, stock ex the, the New York Stock Exchange project, I'm remembering that one. Yeah, yeah, uh, and the mm -hmm. Virtual Time Museum, and we did really, I think, I'm pretty sure it's probably the first, if not the only fully virtual museum that was ever designed back then. Uh, now there's a lot of talk about virtual museums, virtual art, uh, museums virtual art, you, you, know, you guys included, how you exist uh, in, in the digital. So, but at that time, there was nothing like that. And so, you know, we had done this crazy ambitious project with the Guggenheim. Uh, and then we also teamed up at the time with the Hermitage and, and the uh, Kunsthistorische and ZKM in Karlsruhe. Uh, it was, I mean, really kind of amazing uh, that that group of museums to work with us on, on the on the digital museum, um, mm -hmm. and we 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 found some you know remarkable discoveries and so on. But I think what what happened for us personally as a as a practice, um, it always made us have one foot in the in the virtual, obviously one foot in the um, in the sort of uh, you know in the ether, let's say, of, of of the digital, and and another foot in reality. Um, and and so when this took hold. There was a kind of a natural, it was natural for us to, um, in a strange way, in a weird way, in a perverse way, uh, to be talking to our staff on Zoom and for me to be teaching on Zoom. I mean, I spent an entire semester, I graduated three fantastic master's uh, students in, in Vienna, um, four actually, um, I guess one of them thinks I left them out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, entirely digital, as, as many of us did, uh, you know, all the crits, all the decision making, everything done in the isolation of their their own rooms and apartments and, and me in my own in my own studio. Um, and um, so in a weird and uncanny way, it sort of felt normal. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think coming out of that kind of weird normalcy, if you can call it that, we're now in a new normal. Um, and I think the new normal is is beginning to show its um, it's beginning to show us some interesting hybrids and permutations of the real. And for example, one small crazy example is that I don't need to travel as much. Um, I don't see the purpose in. I mean, we, we're running a very big project right now in, in another part of the world. Uh, we've had you know three meetings a week. Um, and, and constant meetings and constant dialogue with our clients. And there are a lot of clients, so it's a very big project. Um, and I would have never been able to do that, uh, dealing with airports, airplanes, time, uh, jet lag, uh, you know, and all of that stuff that comes along with it. And so the efficiency is interesting. Um, and then the question is, what, 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 is, what are the deficiencies, right? What's, yeah. what's being defined in that, that dynamic? But, but do you think this, this kind of uh, change of, of uh, meeting with your clients uh, would have been possible without COVID-19? Could you simply yeah. have said, you know, guys, I'm sick of traveling. I don't think this is the right thing to do. Sustainability-wise, this is uh, insane. We should, we should use technologies that exist. We can perfectly communicate, and we don't I, need to meet each other. Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been waving that flag and singing that battle cry for, for over 15 years. Um, and, really? And, uh -huh. you know, I, I Skyped with my son when he was three, and he's now 23. So that shows you how, how long we've been working with Skype. Um, but, but what's really amazing, and this is a very interesting thing that happened to us exactly on this project. It's a particular project in a particular part of the world that I'm not, that I don't love going to, but you know, I sort of have to, and it's a long way to go. Um, and and, I, and the name of the client will, will remain nameless to protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> but I um, was begging them, we were begging them that we would do a, a, a Skype. We thought we were using Skype pre-pandemic was Skype. So I said, let's do a Skype call. They're like, no, no, you have to come. We have to meet. You have to sign off. We have to sign off. We have to have all the stakeholders in the same space together. Uh, there's no way we're going to do this. And they pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And I was pushing back the other way because I had, um, I'd been in Italy actually in, in December um, and, and January, and I was beginning to worry that I had this thing because like right at the beginnings, you could feel. Um, yeah. You know, and so I, I was saying, no, 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 and this is a part of the world where they didn't have a lockdown. They didn't really believe it was happening. Um, yeah. 
And so all of a sudden, it was, it was this dramatic week one week where they called us and said, I don't want to do their accent. <laughs> and they said, okay, we'll do it. We'll do a Zoom session. Uh, we'll try. It. We'll try okay. it. Now they are in love with it. I mean, they, you can't, I can't stop them from doing Zoom sessions with us. And they're every day planning another one. And they've got, you know, we had 21 people yesterday on a call. Uh, they'll probably go up to 40 people next time. I mean, it's become second. So, and, and then I was thinking about the amount of jet fuel we saved, the amount of aging I managed to save on, uh, the amount of um, time consumed in just getting over there and dealing with all of this bureaucracy, not to mention, um, the the social dynamics of dealing with so many stakeholders uh, when they're not forced to make a decision. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a situation where you have a number of people who show up to the meetings, some don't, uh, maybe there's a lunch, a dinner. Uh, the whole thing is, is incredibly Baroque, right? Mm -hmm. This brought into some strange kind of focus uh, and, and the project is moving rapid fire. I mean, it's astonishing to watch. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think I think finally we we might have learned um, all of us collectively that there are a lot of things uh, we've added to our lives, a lot of complexity that's not necessary. And then the flip side of that question is, what about you know maybe we start adding necessary complexity, right? Mm -hmm. Like it means something. Like if I go to see you now, and, and we talked this morning, you said you have a three mile swim to the office, which to to your to your museum, which I think is brilliant, and you know. I think <laughs> three kilometers, I think to, to you know, it, it'll be a very special thing to see you in person and maybe we do that swim together to the museum or whatever. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, a, that's the other side, right? That yeah. A kind of, yeah. So we're, we're maybe better able to distinguish between, you know, physical experiences that are worth having and other experiences that are worth having virtually, right? And so maybe we are, we're able to kind of, um, discriminate better, uh, where is the expenditure of actual physical movement really, really uh, interesting and necessary? And then discovering that um, other, other virtual experiences can be actually even better, even more efficient than having to go to, uh, to the pain of flying to the place. Well, yeah. well not, it's not really that. Also, um, and, it's, and I think, you know, I know, I know you're quite, this question is going to come up, obviously, because I know you. Uh, I think it, it's impact on architecture mm -hmm. and on the about space and urbanism uh, is, is going to be related to this. Mm -hmm. um, already our discussions in the studio when it comes to dealing with, um, and one of the projects we're working on is a, is a big performing arts center. And so, you know, our whole notion of, of people, not, not the fact that we're gonna keep social distancing forever, it's not, it's not about that, but it is about sort of the sense of, of, of uh, let's put it this way, there's a kind of newborn dignity in personal space. Mm -hmm. Something that existed, I think, more so in the 19th century, honestly. I think we kind of degraded that through the 20th century. Um, and all of a sudden, we're back to, uh, not back, but we're kind of in a, we're revisiting this thing, this idea of giving people their space, uh, giving space space, right? So that you don't have to like efficiently plan, uh, you know, to stuff 500 people in an auditorium. You, you can start to rethink the, the spatiality of that. Um, you know, I, I live in Brooklyn and, and, and looking out the window at the Brooklyn Park where I live, um, I've noticed, like if I just transform the image in, in, in sort of Photoshop or something from people jogging in masks, running in masks, in couples or singly, to promenading in 19th century Paris with, umbra with parasols. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's, there's some weird correlation there. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think that's that's the silver lining here. I think we we're going. You know, you know. It, it, yes, give people their personal space, and yes, you don't need to be on top of each other. And yes, relationships can be meaningful, and and spatiality therefore can be meaningful in terms mm -hmm. of how we deal with each other. Yeah, it's interesting. In in one way, one can describe oh, that's the way I describe this COVID nineteen crisis a little bit like an an an, un, an unsolicited feasibility study in the ability of our society to be resilient and, and uh, change to, or let's say, accommodate to challenges it didn't plan to meet. And in some way, I have the feeling we're kind of surprised to see that we're actually able to adapt to things much better than we would have assumed our society to be able for. So if, if we accept this hypothesis for a second, what would be a, a, a meaningful example for this kind of phenomenon 
in the world of architecture or of, of urban design for you? You mean the uh, the phenomena of um, uh, of, of this kind of this kind of changeability, or let's say the 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 you know the the ability to actually make a, a development step forward that had we talked about it before uh, would have been uh, kind of described as unrealistic, impossible, idealistic, will not work, uh, the market cannot do it, and somehow now that we are actually forced to change very quickly. Um, um, boom, we saw we were able and um, because I think there's a there's a couple of innovations happening in in the way that we make buildings, we manage buildings, we conceive buildings, but also in, in the ways that, that we actually make the city. And so I was wondering if there's if there's any kind of examples for you that you could describe in that kind of context. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, it, it runs the gamut of, of, of all all public realm, but I think Let's put it this way. It seems to me that we were in a kind of a conceptual, or how should I put this? Um, it was a kind of bubble, right? Uh, the, the, the bubble, like, like the stock market has a bubble or, the, or anything has one. We, we had one in our discipline, which had to do, I think, with all kinds of chatter or, or, uh, or discourse around environmental sustainability, around the, the, the planet, about the use of materials, um, and the change and the changes we should think about, uh, mm -hmm. how we build. Um, how we deal with social space even was already in the mix. I mean, it's, it's interesting how much of this stuff was kind of in there, bubbling to the surface um, in that pre-pandemic moment, right? And what's happened like a blister, <laughs> this thing burst. And all that stuff is incredibly relevant now. And, but it's relevant with, with, a, with a focus on it that's real, not hypothetical. It's no longer something in the academic that, that my students talk about, let's say, or that we talk about you know, uh, in theory. Um, we're all of a sudden in a situation where we have to think very realistically about um, how, to, how, to work, how to deal with this planet environmentally, for example. I mean, I have to say, you know, again, in New York City, I, I am shocked at, um, at how clean the air is. Um, you know, I, I, I ride a bike to work and it, it's pal it's pal it's, the difference is palpable. You know, it's this mm -hmm. situation. Um, and so the fact of the matter is we have, we've had a test run a little, a little litmus test, or as you say, a little feasibility study on um, on a better environment to live in. Um, we're having a test run on better social, better ideas of how we deal in social space and and and, and, and urban space. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, you know, you, you think back to all the kind of models of urbanism, um, uh, especially in New York, and and all the discussion around things like stoops and and public space and public realm and, and the urban living room and all of these, you know, Jane Jacobs kind of discussions from, from, from a while back. And also how those things have come back to the surface. I mean, you see, you know, look, I rode my bike here this morning. I have to tell you, if I, if I was transported onto my bike uh, without knowing which city I was in, I might have been riding through Munich or I might have been riding through Bologna because all of a sudden there's street, every restaurant is on the street. Every restaurant, all of a sudden, out of the blue, has got a street uh, presence which with flowers all around it and has taken up the parking spaces so I don't get doored by cars anymore as a bike. I can just kind of like <laughs> ride by restaurants. Uh, I mean, there's a civility there. There's an urban, <laughs> the newfound urban civility that's, that's come about. Um, now, will all this stick? That's an interesting question. Will factors of greed and, uh, and, and uh, you know, sort of, uh, I'll say it's stupidity when it comes mm -hmm. to urban. Uh, and, and other factors take back hold and say, no, you know, get rid of all the street cafes. That was just during the pandemic. Let's go back to everybody in air conditioned places, uh, put cars back all over the streets, uh, get rid of all the, you know, the sort of human humanization that we've, we've taken on. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's more, what's interesting to me is that this is more of a kind of a, it's something that kind of ripped open the issues that we already were discussing and mm -hmm. just uh, in academia, in trying to in practice. The difference is we didn't have cl clients wouldn't listen. You know, prior to this, it would be hard to tell, um, you know, uh, clients about uh, the value of open air um, scenarios for program, the value of, uh, of decongesting public space, um, the value of dealing with better hygienic materials and, and things that actually absorb CO2, right? I mean, mm -hmm. for that, um, you know. Now these are like, we can really say these things. And, and we were actually, people can pay, they'll pay attention because they know that 
the longevity of their businesses, their developments, their projects, uh, and the publicity around those projects will rely very much on these things, not just as catchphrases or marketing strategies, but mm -hmm. as implementable uh, things. At least that's my hope, but you know, yeah. it's Eternal optimist over here. <laughs> yeah, but maybe maybe architects also have a higher, a, a bigger leverage in in arguing with their clients and um, in favor of of changing these protocols now that they have a reference that they can point to. You know, now you can actually say, "Do you remember during the pandemic, I didn't fly to your place. We 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 communicated like this and we moved the project ahead, even better than before." Right. So maybe we can capitalize on this kind of um, experience that we can trace, you know, can say this was actually true. This was a reality. And so let's not just devalue it as a, as a mere crisis management. You know? no, absolutely. And I think, I think you, can, you can run that equation through almost all aspects of our profession from the, from the uh, visualization and, <clears throat> and uh, conceptualization stage um, and the client liaison stage right through to the process. Um, and through to the sort of scenarios of, of, mm -hmm. of an work and, and what we actually build. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's really key. And I, I kind of hope, I mean, I would hate to see this thing continue, of course, and everybody, we want to get this thing over with. But I really do hope that we hold on to um, all the upticks in, 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 in value, um, in, in sort of uh, improvement. And don't look at it from the point of view of all the downticks, because, of course, there are many and they are dramatic. Mm -hmm economic or, uh, or, or, you know, we have tall buildings all over this city that are empty. Um, what are they going to do with these buildings, right? Uh, you know, if, if this thing continues. Uh, uh, this, is, this is actually an interesting help, question help. because, for instance, they, in... They're now evil, you know, it's a fantastic... Yeah. You know, this yeah. is talking about a flip from 60s utopianism and 60s notions of, uh, you know, the elevator is an evil thing to get into. You can't get in with more than so many people. Does the air circulate? You don't want to be in an open office plan anymore. Uh, you have 400 people stuffed on an office floor, 80 stories in the air. Um, you know, so, so a lot of things, um, if this continues to drive home certain realities, uh, are going to have to be reassessed. Um, yeah. It's interesting that, you know, one of the, the utopian goals of modernism was um, a certain proximity of live and work or a negotiability between uh, um, living and working. And uh, of course, we know that then with the charts of Athens, uh, these realms have been very strongly segregated in, in urban design and urban planning. And there was a place in the city where people should work. And then there was another place where people would live. And now this paradigm obviously seems challenged a lot when big major enterprises, for instance, in Basel, Novartis, big pharma uh, giant um, has just announced after completing their huge campus with lots and lots of buildings, uh, with the urban design by Lampugnani, um, where they created a lot of jobs and a lot of buildings with jobs, um, a lot of buildings that, that have offices and research uh, laboratory space and so on. They basically announced that they offer to all of their employees that they can continue to work in home office indefinitely if they choose to want to. So people who want to come to the office, they can do that. But everybody who thinks it's better to work at home for them, they will be able to do that. We don't know yet what the response of the employees will be, the percentage of people that prefer to stay home. But I think it seems obvious that a large percentage of the spaces they just created for their work will be redundant. While at the same time, the demands to the apartment, to your home, to the domestic space will radically change because we it's a place where we also need to be able to work while kids are playing while somebody is living and doing something else so how do you what do you think architects can do to actually facilitate this potentially major paradigm shift in the ways that we understand typology I mean, work typologies our, and if, living typologies it, i'd love for them to give me a call because i think we should turn all of their campuses into urban farms uh, <laughs> and produce lots of healthy food for everyone. And, and uh, I don't know, I mean, there's gotta be some other scenarios. I say, look, Google, Google just decided that their staff does not have to go back to the campus or to their offices until 2022. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's global. They, that's wow. every one of their businesses. They're not even saying you can come back. Uh, my son is in that industry and his, one of his best friends is a Google guy. And he just called him and said, you know, 
I'm going to be working at home until 2022 and, and there's nowhere to go other than home. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a dramatic, dramatic thing uh, when it comes to uh, these, these dinosaur buildings that have been produced mm -hmm. around uh, something that should have changed a long time ago anyway. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, a reality thing. The other thing that's interesting is, is, the, is the hybrid uh, notion of, of live work, um, which all of a sudden gets really interesting in this, in this environment, right? Um, how, how one can, in fact, um, commute without commuting, how one can uh, sort of share space with other people without necessarily uh, mm -hmm. risking. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of interesting questions there about, of, so we may be looking at the birth of a kind of, of a serious paradigm shift in the way we think of, um, of producing um, uh, places to live and work in uh, as we go forward. Right now, it's obvious trying to make the best of where they live to work and then what's a work uh, and what the what becomes of those places. So it's an interesting. But, yeah, it seems to me that this would shift the, uh, let's say the, um, the focus of the area of intervention of an architect from the realm of new construction to modifying existing built building stock, don't you think? I mean, it's, yeah, it's not, uh, not, with, not out of, not out of uh, sort of reason to think that way. It's definitely, something's going to have to, there would be probably a, a massive um, uh, potential for architects to, to consider the, what happens to these um, existing, and, and, it, and, it, and it can get very dramatic because we're not just talking about single buildings. Uh, it's a little bit like, you know, I mean, I'm doing a study now. We're starting a study now in Vienna, or we might study a study in Vienna. We've been asked to. I don't know if we'll go forward with it, but we've asked by the city of Venice, uh, by the uh, Commune in Venice, to look at um, doing some hypothetical projects as to what becomes of Venice uh, as, as, as time moves on, given they have triple crisis, right? They have the, the flooding, they have tourism, and then they have COVID. Um, and at the same time, they're kind of a museum city, right? It's, it mm. is a museum thinking. Um, so it's a very interesting and particular problem. It's a very different problem of obsolescence to, let's say, midtown Manhattan or lower Manhattan. But that's, that's another obsolescence kind mm -hmm. of situation that has to be described and discussed. So those are different scales. But the, uh, the intervention of the architect into those scales is a really interesting one. And actually, that brings up another interesting point from, from where I sit, when I think in the preamble to this before, when you and I just were testing the video, um, I was talking about the sort of the kind of passion that I have personally in this practice at Asymptote, but also with my teaching at the Angavante, um, to, to consider um, how the profession has been sort of um, degraded over time uh, and, how, and what is the reestablishment of the architect uh, and the architect's role in society uh, in terms of being a profession or being a kind of a... Um, uh, a pertinent, let's say, player in, in that sphere, right? Because, and the reason I say that is I've watched the practice, not our practice, well, it's partially our practice, but I've watched the notion of practice get degraded a little bit by um, the importance of consultants, right? Uh, I mean, how many times, you know, I remember walking into a room one day and, and my, my designers were sitting around with three or four consultants and I said, wait a minute, these guys are designing the project. You know, what do you guys do? You know? <laughs> what's what's yeah. your Everything's run by MEP, structural, uh, you know, uh, you name it, uh, IT. You know, what, what's, your, what's your specialty? What are we doing here, right? And those just sort of anecdotal. But I've become really interested in that, that, that being, and, it, and it's, not, it's not a throwback to, you know, the days of what I call the Cape and Cane days and of, of, of the great masters of modernism, modernity, where, you know, whether it's Korb or Alto or... The siren, whomever it is, right, walks in a room and commands complete respect, right? Um, and everybody just, you know, whoa, what, what does the architect have to say about this? You know, there was that, that was a kind of a mythical moment in, in our discipline, early 20th, 20th century. In a way, it kind of killed us because you had the star architects of the 80s and 90s um, who kind of hoped to have that persona, who carried that kind of aura with them anyway, but the whole thing was falling apart because at the end of the day, not. The, the, the sort of rampant formalism was not going to be the, the sort of thing that was super respected. It was only respected from a marketing point of view, but it was like, okay, they're giving us a very cool looking thing. Uh, what is mm -hmm. this? Market this for a while and that kind mm -hmm. of course. Um, mm -hmm. so to your point, um, we, we may be looking at a, a kind of window here or an opportunity where architects can seriously reestablish themselves as having 
uh, a kind of position, a polemic, uh, a, a sort of uh, a story and an expertise um, that is really relevant and, and not gratuitous and not sort of just kind of the icing on the cake, right, mm -hmm. to, to developers you know, desire. And that's really interesting. I wonder if we'll see that as a professional. It'll be interesting to see. And if we see that in academia, and we'll see that. But, but yeah, let's, let's take this to a level of certain concreteness. If we take Manhattan now and, and the situation of um, the, the stock of buildings that you can live in and the stock of buildings that you can work in, and you realize office buildings will be, I mean, there's a superfluous uh, offer of it. Um, you don't need as much, while as people need bigger homes. How do you make homes bigger in New York City where we already know that homes are very small, very compact because people are used to live in the city? Um, you don't have a big dining room because you go to the restaurant and eat there. Uh, many friends of mine, when I studied there, lived in spaces impossible to live in, actually like 20 square meters or smaller. And so if the mayor of New York calls your office tomorrow and asks you, um, can you please solve this question? I have so many office buildings I don't know what to do with. And I have so many demands of, of basically doubling the apartment space per, per person so that people can actually work in their homes. How would you go about it? Well, this is, this is where, and maybe it's, the, um, maybe it's the teacher in me, but this is where uh, a knowledge of the history of our discipline is so interesting. Like most people would, I think what's interesting, and this is one of my, my battle cries with my students in general, is to know our history, because one approach to what you just said would be a prosaic kind of pragmatic approach of saying, okay, you know, uh, let's, we'll, we'll have to gut these things and maybe we produce, you know, courtyards and maybe this is where fresh air comes in. Maybe we do kind of, we, you know, we work kind of hybrids, blah, blah, blah. And that's all very good. And it's all very pragmatic. And, but I can't help but think about House Rooker and Co. I can't help but think about Archigram, uh, Cedric Price, uh, you know, uh, a whole bunch of, of people historically, Arkazum, UFO, um, we've had a remarkable history in the avant-garde, especially in the 60s and 70s in Europe. Of, of forward thinking radical architects who had nowhere near a commission to do anything they were thinking about, but were producing some remarkably powerful images and, and, and striking polemics around this topic, right? I think of mm -hmm. Super Studio Infinite City, for example, or, um, you know, or, or yeah, all of these kind of things that start to come to mind. What I'm saying by that is, is that I would start with a double kind of prong approach, which could also drive my clients crazy, but on the one hand would be what I just described, right? Typical, you know, sort of engineering approach to the future, right? Because mm -hmm. you can establish that. The other is to say, well, look, you know, when House Rooker and Co. imagined sticking bubbles outside of window of, of buildings with these kind of, you know, environments, right? Uh, these self-contained, weird, hermetic environments, um, or if Price thought about a kind of um, that a public space becomes a kind of place of incredible, well, the fun palace becomes a place of incredible intersection and, and, and kind of, you know, um, let's say socialization. Um, mm -hmm. We could start drawing on some of those things uh, and bringing them back to the fore uh, and saying, you know, maybe those models were, were way ahead of their time. And are there any of these things we could apply to today's problems that would, that would help? And there's a lot there. I mean, everything, even Paolo Solari, for God's sake. I mean, there's, there's so much... Um, history and discourse around uh, the environment and socialization and spatialization of social um, that, that we could we could be calling on uh, as part of our of our kind of research into this. So we're not really starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. It's the, um, a problem which is all of a sudden entirely new. I mean, look when you think about Solari, the stuffing what a hundred thousand million people in a in a flying kind of weird uh, self-contained environment around the earth, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> placing Tokyo with some kind of object. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's kind of the power of, it's also something I miss a lot generationally now I watch and, and see around me in the work is that um, the ability to anticipate all kinds of powerful, strange futures was, was obviously much more fervent in that period today. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to get 100,000 hits on Instagram if you design some remarkably visionary uh, notion of the future that, that it needs to be eye-catching at a, at a scale of a phone. Uh, it needs to be a soundbite. It needs to deal with some kind of issue. And, you know, you'll get lots of hits if it's made out of some kind of 
you know, sustainable wood with some plants on it. <laughs> you know, that's that's the, that's the the radical at the moment. I, I mean, I'm being facetious, but I think that um, it. So to answer your question, I think it's a matter of of looking back to look forward, um, and and trying to understand what some of the really high end research in our discipline already anticipated, even though they didn't necessarily know about this particular pandemic or this particular crisis. Um, mm -hmm. No, just you know what was interesting in the 60s and 70s from what i understand in in, in the rhetoric was uh, the notion of an overpopulated planet was already in the, in the discussion the notion of the global village of course um, you know mcluhan uh, was uh, being discussed and, and bantered around as part of part of the theory around what we did uh, so i think it's it's interesting so to answer you know to try and answer your question i think the the answer to to de Blasio <laughs> would be, you know, uh, yeah, let me have it. Let me let me work on this. Um, and, and yes, we will we will you know con think about this thing in an incredibly open way as to what you can add, what you can subtract. Um, what and and then the big thing that wasn't around in the sixties and seventies is this technology, um, the seamlessness of, of of the global mega village, right? The ability mm -hmm. to worry. Um, to, to move in time and space as we do now, as you and I are, you're in Switzerland, I'm here in New York, it's, it's you know, uh, seamless though. And we didn't have that period. That wasn't part of the, the kind of avant-garde thinking about, about mm -hmm. the future, even in the wildest dreams, mm -hmm. right? But let's be a bit more specific in terms of what, what, you, what you could actually do. Um, just to give you an example, I was speaking with Jeannie Gang a while ago in this series. And she was mentioning that she she would take as a consequence from this crisis to not build any apartment anymore that doesn't have an outdoor space. So that the balcony or a loggia or something like this becomes a must in order to have a space where you can actually experience open air and that the fully sealed air conditioned um, environment should be a thing of the past. That I think is an interesting kind of statement to say, for instance, because that's something you can actually hold against a client or say, you know, look, we're not doing this. We think this is necessary. And I'm thinking of, of, of decisions like these, or for instance, uh, Lacaton Vassal from France, you know, they've been working in, in the past uh, to try to, to safeguard or to, to prevent buildings, uh, apartment towers or slabs from the 60s from demolition, the dem demolition and the way that they would do it, it would be to say, actually, we can, we can expand these spaces by adding a winter garden to their facade, which uh, gives a second, uh, second layer of the facade, producing a, a buffer space thermally between the actual outdoor, the actual indoor, and it makes them environmentally more powerful, these buildings, and it increases living space, which was um, a big issue in this case. Actually, those buildings, with this kind of 20% increase of residential surface, which is an average uh, term, I think, in their projects in Bordeaux. Um, they have actually supplied, avant la lettre, somehow, without knowing, a space that is outside the domestic program of the apartment, this kind of winter garden space that is actually usable most of the year, and that um, turned out to provide that kind of extra space you needed if you wanted to have some space in the apartment where you could withdraw yourself, this type of personal space that you were referring to before. So I'm interested in the, the kind of typological ingenuity of contemporary architecture to, to twist, let's say, the typological protocols of what we thought an apartment was or an office space was, or what an office space, a space could be other than just an office space. Because I think we, we need this kind of resilience or elasticity in the ways we, we, we interpret buildings today. And don't you think that this could maybe be almost more relevant or central for architecture today than coming up with glamorous, uh, fantastic oh. new solutions? Well, okay, so here's the thing. You know, you're absolutely right. And I think that the band-aiding, um, we, we have a patient here, let's say, that needs more than band-aids, but the band-aids are important, right? Mm -hmm. to stop. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. I, I'm, totally, I'm totally on board with, um, you know, kind of, let's say, practical, pragmatic, enactable solutions that, that we can enact in, in terms of, of, I don't know if that's going to necessarily shift the needle dramatically in terms of architecture, but it definitely is, is something that's, that's, that's important. One thing that's interesting about what you just described, and, and I've often thought about this, 
I guess because we work internationally um, and, and are finding ourselves always up against different building codes and different societies and different perceptions of this problem, we've mm -hmm. seen all kinds of interesting permutations of this in different cultures. For example, we did a, a tower in Korea um, where the, uh, from, from a code point of view and from a, uh, a business point of view, we weren't allowed to do balconies. We were not allowed to do balconies. Uh, what we were allowed to do was what they called a solarium, right? And a solarium was uh, something where you could slide the doors open, but it had to be part of the living space. And this is in code. This is like, in, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's enshrined on some document. You can't like break it no matter what you do. So of course we had to debate around that code and figure out how, you know, because yes, we wanted these things to open. We wanted to have balconies. We had to find a way to, to, to sort of design in such a way that your solarium, which we would put on paper as such, would in fact transform into a fresh air. Uh, but on the other mm -hmm. hand, in in, in Korea, they're obsessed with cross ventilation. Um, <laughs> that is wild. I, you know, I was sitting in a meeting and we were told we have to um, produce, and that's why m many of the buildings look the way they do. The cores are where they are because um, the fact that you have to cross ventilate the apartments. People will not buy an apartment, and it's in code as well, without cross ventilation, mm -hmm. which we do here. You know, we, we live in a weird, different world when it comes to code. Um, so we designed this, uh, I don't know if you know, the, the project, the Bello Towers, uh, which in fact were based on kind of rings um, with, with open courts um, so that you could actually rain through the middle of these courtyards up in the sky. Uh, and you could basically have cross ventilation because you're always on a kind of uh, plan, uh, mm -hmm. you know, situation where you basically have two windows that open across, right? So mm -hmm. all I'm saying by that is that there are so many um, weird rules in place in different countries and different societies that are, that are kind of, for whatever reason, ended up becoming code and code becomes our kind of the bane of our existence when it comes to these issues. You can dream up all kinds of interesting avant-garde radical solutions to better the situation, but if you hit the wall with issues, uh, it's game. So what I'm talking about when I mentioned all the precedents I talked about and the kind of radical approach to this would be, how do you change the building code, right? How do you change people's um, a priori perception of mm -hmm. what supposed to be so that you can do uh, for Jeannie, you know, working in Chicago to do what she's doing, it's fine, but try and do that in a culture where uh, they won't allow you to do a balcony. You know, you're mm -hmm. going to have to break to get around it and you're going to have to find a way to also um, somehow hopefully. So, so what I'm really saying is that it, what's interesting for us as architects is we need to command again, a kind of a, a kind of a, a authority that's warranted that allows us to, to say to make public policy change uh, yeah. on many levels um, it's interesting it reminds me of this one um, saying of Bernard Trumi um, uh, where he said uh, architecture is not about the conditions of design but the design of conditions and designing the code you know or, or kind of influencing the code would be that wouldn't it because it would completely redefine the uh, the territory of intervention of architects because it would exclude no-nos and taboos uh, that we accepted hitherto. And maybe there's a certain kind of civil disobedience needed from architects to say, we, we need to attack those codes because they, they don't make sense in some, in some ways. But what will be the agency um, needed to do this type of uh, hacking the code? Um, can you do this from the position of an architect or do you need to kind of go into some other capacity well, I, I, we've, that's an interesting question. We've had that. We've bantered that question around a, a lot in academia because I've, I've often thought, you know, we're training architects. Um, you know, we think, we think we're training architects, but sometimes, and, and Greg and I discussed this in Vienna, but sometimes we're, we may be training public, public policymakers, right? It would, it would, they would have more impact on our profession if they left architecture school with a master's degree, but then became, uh, you know, with, with, with knowledge and with a breadth of knowledge, and again, with history, honestly, with history, with a whole kind of uh, set of, of requisites and, and ideas, and then became someone who actually was, was, was sitting in a meeting with the people who actually can write the codes and are thinking about these things, right? Mm -hmm. Not just engineers, not just, and, and, um, but actually architects are part of that equation. Mm -hmm. You know, then was, you know, has been teaching at Columbia for a while, one of her best students, um, got a job and she was very excited about it. And she said, where are you working? She says, you're working for um, Sidewalk Labs. And Sidewalk Labs is Google, was Google's uh, now defunct 
uh, City of the Future project, right, where they were taking up part of Toronto and trying to, you know, do, develop their so-called City of the Future. So Lisa mm -hmm. was very you know, excited about that. One of her students was working for Silo Web. Says, so how many how many architects are are how big is the group? And she said it's five thousand people or four thousand oh, are are the company. And it's like wow, uh, under Doctor Up. And then and then uh, she said, well, how many architects? She said, I'm the second one. Oh my. Who are uh, in in the entire sidewalk lab project, which is 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 you know, that's shocking, criminal, and 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 it says two things. It says either a they don't see any value in other than maybe I don't know what is the value, putting some visualizations, putting some trees on the sidewalks. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or they just fundamentally don't understand what the architect brings to the table, and I, I think it's the second one. I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding on the part of cities, mayors, policymakers, large corporations, as to the value, because, and, and I said this earlier to you to you earlier, and I do think it's one of the leftover, the nail in that coffin really came from Star Architects. I know it sounds mm -hmm. strange, but I think it is part of the problem that, that architecture became less and less relevant at the policy level, at the, at the, um, the level of actually changing things in some dramatic way because of a public good or a perception of the world that has to shift and more and more about marketing um, mm -hmm. and that that you know and i have to say i blame my friends uh that are older than me um, for having um, allowed that to happen by virtue of, of their own sort of fiefdoms around their stylistic works and their kind of uh, positions and polemics um you mean so, people yeah. like kolhas Zaha, whatever, you know, that generation. The, the, the deconstructivist show kind of the, league, basically. The, and, you know, I know, you know, I, I, yeah, the whiskey and uh, Zaha, yes, but at least, yeah, Zaha, yeah, you know, yes, Rem, even Rem, quite frankly. Um, mm -hmm. the Rem of all of them um, at least has made, um, has tried to make these kind of swerves in, in the road and, and has, has brought some very interesting things to, to, the, to the profession, but still, and it's not their fault. I think what happened was it, it's a little bit like also in the design world, and I have a relative in the design world. It's, mm -hmm. it's a bit, um, the pressure put on from the perception outside of what the value is of what's being brought to the table, right? Um, you mean, and, you think they're, they're a victim of the Guggenheim effects? Because once clients and mayors understood what a fancy, shiny building can do to a city that nobody knew before, um, they were all kind of getting addicted to that kind of method? Definitely a poster child for that. I mean, definitely, I'll never forget when the, when the Guggenheim, uh, when, when Gary's Guggenheim showed up on the cover of New York Times magazine before it was built, I think it was a rendering actually, um, people were already salivating at the idea that uh, an image, uh, an image of a building can generate so much, um, so much noise. Um, mm -hmm. I think, yes, that, that's part of it. Uh, you quoted Bernard before. Bernard said something else interesting to me once. He, he sort of looked at all the renderings that are all over the internet. Of, 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 and, and we're just as guilty. We're all guilty of it as, as firms. We have to produce these kind of ridiculously sexy renderings, right, to get them to the clients, get them out in the world. But he called it archie porn. And, and I thought, you know, it's interesting that, that we are like proliferating these images. Um, of, and, from, and, and then you see also the, the weird kind of... Um, blur between um it's a little bit like like um it's like ripping music you know it's like making you have a, a, a an authentic piece of music and everyone can sort of rip a different kind of uh, do a different sort of version of it to the point where it, where it sometimes gets obliterated but you really can't ever tell the original again and, and where the original polemic was i think the other poster child for what you're describing was the um helsinki guggenheim competition of course. Yeah. which you know ended up being just this madness of, of 1,500 entries, every one of them stylistically different, everyone equally ineffectual and uninteresting, um, and, and to the point where there was no dis, you know, that's, that's part of what the, the mess has tail end of it. So it might have started with Frank in Bilbao, but it ended definitely, hopefully it's, it, it came to a pretty giant reality by the time yeah. Helsinki had their competition. That's true. Um, so in a way, I mean, we, we should come to a close. We have um, a, a couple of more minutes. Um, what I was wondering is, you described yourself before a little bit, your generation as architects, a little bit in the shadow of this kind of master generation 
of you know the people from the de deconstructivist show and so on and that you have to kind of establish your own agenda in order to make a mark to distinguish yourself from that type of work and you you chose for instance the the path of the exploration of the virtual and all these kind of things interactive um, um, architectures and so on how would you describe if we say that this type of generation we just spoke about is kind of in their golden fall somehow and uh, um, slowly receding from from the professional stage, I think it would be, of course, onto your generation to shift the agenda to issues that seem relevant and critical today. Which of these issues would you think um, should that be uh, that maybe you wouldn't have thought about so intensely before the crisis, um, but that you think you will actually engage in and invest in um, from from now on, basically. Yeah. No, it's, I mean it's a, it's 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 a good question, and it's something that we've always um, found ourselves in a, in a weird dilemma about because you know this is from the very beginning of our careers by virtue of our I guess when we were born and and and, and what our where we fit in in the situation. But yeah, you know, for a long time and and still to the you know the wake of of, of star architecture um, allowing you to operate behind that wake has been kind of strange. At the same time, you know, exactly, I liken it to jumping ship. Uh, I remember jumped ship on Decon. I remember, I remember we were very, very young. We were both 26 years old, I think, or something. And here we were lumped into the Decon group, Un unknowing, unbeknown to us. I mean, uh, we, we were like all of a sudden, we're in the film, for God's sake. We're at the tail end of the film. We're two kids. If you look at this film, you'll see the two of us at the end, you know, completely ch like children. Um, who all of a sudden got corralled into that because of our work and our work was radical work and so therefore radical work must all be it must all be decon right mm -hmm. um, then and then we kind of jumped ship and became kind of leaders of, of, of another gender of, of the people more or less our age and younger than us um, and now you know I think what's happened is we have we, we've jumped two ships actually um, because we are we are kind of not interested so much in, in many of the things that, that we were sort of uh, embroiled in and part of it seems over the years and, and have become much more focused on, on I guess a couple of things I would say one is um, building the, the notion of building um, but building now with uh, the kind of intelligence and tools we have at our disposal which is a radically different when I built the Yaz Hotel 10 years ago um, we we did that project in record time it was 21 months from mouse click to uh, the Formula One race that those 21 months I mean not a lot of people think of know that but if you think about it the, the rapidity of the construction the quality of the construction and the quality of the architecture uh, had a lot to do with um, our sort of, um, um, depth of knowledge and interest in technology uh, we were one of the major BIM projects it was one of the first um, projects that was able to be kind of built the way it was built as in rapidity it was built in and so on and we were able to model it and we were able to do all these scenario virtual reality scenarios of its construction and crane conflicts all this stuff that was part of that um that taught us a big lesson right that there's a there's a future in really knowing your tools uh, and knowing how to use them um, and being able to to do things quite effect effectively and not not driven by pure form or or, or pure um sort of image on the second one um, is probably the one now coming out of the post-COVID period, which is really a, a, a very deep um, interest in and, 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 and comprehension of, um, I would call it, I would call it sustainable social space, for lack of a better way of putting it, right? Uh -huh. That it's not just sustainability in terms of materials and environment, it has to do with sustainability of the human condition, um, as, as weird okay. as that's. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's something that's that's totally taking us over. Um, our discourse has changed. I mean, I, I walked around here before, at the beginning of this, which thank you for allowing me to do that. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, but in those five months, I, I would say to come in here and see the, the, the frozen moment of our studio five months ago and to think about what we've been talking about the last few days. We only opened this week again. Um, it's completely, we're in a whole new place. Uh, mm -hmm. when it comes, and this idea of sustainable social, social space is really taking hold in a way because everything we're talking about now in our work is about how to produce these environments that make a lot more sense going into the future, that will live and breathe um, with the future and not just become defunct sort of models from a bygone era. Or yeah. Dis so yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's thank you for the question. I, yeah. Thank you. It's been wonderful talking to you. It's been a long time, but we, uh, 
Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. We should do this more often. Yeah. I like the idea of the mental uh, jet lag that you were just describing, you know, to coming into your office and feeling that is that must be someone else's work or it's it's like a long time. And I think, um, yeah, that's a that's a very good and productive setup, actually, to to jumpstart and to jump into a new condition um, to see that five months of, 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 let's say, distance to your own work and this kind of continuous yep. flow um, can create so much recognition. Kind of It's also kind of invigorating and, and kind of amazing because you feel like you're waking up again. And, and it's yeah. funny, when I was in, in grad school, we, we were discussing this thing, uh, this notion of the 19th century sleeper. I don't know what that is, but there was, a, there was a moment in history where people were looking forward to the automobile. They were looking forward to the 20th century, to industrialization. But there were a lot of people who were holding on for dear life to the 19th century. Uh, yes. men, letters, uh, you know, the, you name it, it was all part of that. Yeah. They were called the 19th century sleepers. And I think they were the, they're the pre-COVID sleepers. I think, <laughs> I think there are people, so true. There are people so true. who walk, still don't believe that things have changed. And, yeah. they, and they will change dramatically going forward. They, they have to. And That's, I think I, I'm kind of happy to, uh, to have you know, gone to sleep in the 19th, in the, not 19th century, but in the pre-COVID period and to wake up now in this period and go, wait a minute, this is kind of exciting. It's kind of an interesting, exciting time to work again. Cool. And it feels, in the truth, it's going back, it feels a lot like when we were in our late 20s doing the virtual reality stuff. Um, I remember the day, I remember thinking, this, is, this discipline is ridiculous and I'm going to become a filmmaker. I remember this thought, right? I'm going to just become a filmmaker because I can't take the, the discipline of architecture at that moment. This was the pre-digital because it seemed to me that all we could hear about Everywhere we walked was the modernists, how important modernist architecture was, right? And then you had these kind of weird things like postmodernism and other stuff kind of in them. But it all looks so kind of, you know, and I thought, to myself, what do we do? What um, that we'll do. And I was about to turn off the switch when I got a, when I got a silicon graphics machine. Um, and, and when I turned on the SGI machine back in that period, I was like, wow, this is interesting. We do have a, an opening here. And I remember working in digital and all the older architects, like I remember having a fight with Tom Main because Tom Main refused to use a mouse and a computer. I remember arguing with Bernard Chumi. I remember arguing with even Zaha, believe it or not, in the early days of, of computing. Um, and then that kind of, and now that's kind of like became like, oh God, it's so boring. This switch has been turned on. I was about to turn off the switch five weeks, five week, uh, months ago. I just turned it on again. It's kind of an interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to end. Thanks a lot for your time, honey. It was a pleasure. Wonderful. And um, yeah, and to our audience, uh, we'll be back in a week from now and have more conversations. Um, stay tuned to our Instagram. We'll uh, keep you ahead of the program. A terrific program you're doing. Really, really fantastic. Cool. Thank you. Bye-bye then. Bye.